Is it? Are you Joe Her or Joker? Going live right now, and I think we're live. Okay. Hello. So let's see here. Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. I think we're all set, guys. Okay. Oh, but then I look at the web page, and it looks like we're not. But YouTube says that we are. Let's see here. Moment. Okay. All right. I think nope. We're, we're on. Okay. Yeah. All right. We're all good. Okay, James. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Glenn Jocker. I'm the founder at Ultralytics and the author of Yolo V5 and uh, Yolo V8 also. And I'm here with James Skelton, who's a tech evangelist at Paperspace. And uh, James is going to shed some light on all the awesome stuff going on at Paperspace, the gradient notebooks, and he's going to give us some really cool demos also. So, uh, so James, tell us a little bit about yourself uh, and a little bit about Paperspace to get us started. Yeah, sure. So uh, yeah, as you said, I'm James. Um, I, uh, I've been in the ML world since uh, early 2020. Um, I taught myself Python and then do it, did a uh, three-month coding boot camp and have otherwise been self-taught since then uh, because I always like special, I, I always liked writing and interacting with people. I decided to go into DevRel. So I've been doing that uh, ever since. Um, I've been with Paperspace for the last year and a half uh serving as our technical evangelist and head editor and writer for the blog um if you're not familiar uh paper space is a platform for ai developers to get access to the speed and scale needed to take ai models from concepts production from the cloud while taking advantage of the widest selection of gpu and ipu powered machines available on the internet um with IPU also now huh Oh, sorry. <laughs> IPU oh, yeah, yeah. We have IPUs as well. Definitely. Uh, Graphcore is awesome. <laughs> Graphcore, Definitely recommend yeah, yeah. checking that out uh, to anybody who hasn't that's listening. Um, then uh, Gradient itself is our MLOps platform uh, within Paperspace. And within it's easy to launch a notebook where you can, you know, build a proof of concept or train or, fine or, train or fine-tune models uh, or, you know, whatever you need to be doing to experiment. And then you can take those trained models and deployments and uh, deploy them to scalable API endpoints. Uh, so uh, just a little more about myself. Uh, the majority of my work focuses around uh, finding new deep learning projects and applying them to work on our uh, variety of machines and connecting with developers uh, of exciting projects like, like Ultralytics. Um, some of my work with uh, YOLO V8 and YOLO V5 has been in developing uh, simple tutorials for training custom models. Uh, I'm actually not sure, can I, I think I can just put this in the YouTube chat. Um, I have yeah, some yeah, links you can just can type share. right into YouTube. Also yeah. for our users, uh, you know, feel free to leave questions and comments right there in the YouTube chat and we'll get to those later after we do the demos and the intros here. Perfect. And it has formatted this badly, so one moment. Okay. There we go. <laughs> so you said you spend your time creating kind of like tutorials for all the interesting projects coming out. So you must have your hands really full these days. It feels oh, yeah. like uh, 2023 is just like kind of like one news event after another in the ML world, isn't it? Yeah, I would call it, uh, it feels like an inflection point. I mean, I think we saw, you know, it's interesting. Um, YOLO is actually what I consider to be the first, you know, publicly viable uh, deep learning model. It was the first one that, you know, just anybody could toy around with. It's, e it's even easier now with YOLO V8. Y'all have, y'all have made it amazingly <laughs> easy to use. Uh, but, uh, even YOLO V5, um, compared to a lot of deep learning projects was really straightforward. Um, then last year we got stable diffusion and that just seemed to blow the lid off of everything. And then this year, yeah, yeah. Oh, GPT-4 and Llama are doing that with uh, with the LLMs. So it, it, it's a really wonderful time to be writing and working in it. And um, a lot. It, uh, actually, one of the coolest things I've gotten to do recently was integrate a bunch of those stuff together. Um, so my my latest release project was Auto YOLO, um, which is kind of an automated oh. end-to-end -end, <laughs> uh, object detection. Top it on the Auto GPT trend, huh? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I uh, integrated Dolly V2 with Blip2 and Segment Anything to uh, get an automated uh, data set labeling application together. And then within the GUI, you can take those images and train your models as needed and do inference. Um, and I'll show that off later if we have some time. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a really, really wonderful cool. time to be working yeah, it's, uh, I can't think of another industry where like, 
a year ago, everything looked so different. You know, like most other industries, like the telecommunications industry, even like renewable energy, electric vehicles, like they're relatively similar to 12 months ago. But like the AI space, it's like there's whole new players, like people's attentions are 180. It's pretty interesting. Like I, it's an exciting place to be. So like every day I wake up and I don't know what's going to happen. I'm like kind yeah. of scared, kind of excited. <laughs> well, I think we're getting closer to the point where uh, AI technology is from a software perspective, more resource intensive than the physical hardware can keep up with. I think that we're going to uh, see larger and larger, crazier and crazier models. And uh, that's gonna be the next bottleneck, so to speak. I think that we're kind of in a golden age on the development end where things are, you know, as you said, progressing so rapidly that it, it's almost impossible to see what we were in the past. Um, like I had, uh, hmm. I mentioned stable diffusion earlier. I, I remember when, you know, there was some simpler models like uh, Dolly Mini before that and stuff like that. So much weaker in comparison. It, it really is a meteoric uh, development once somebody figures out the right way to do it. Yeah, it's, it's really easy to say double model size and it performs a little better, but it's not easy to say double your hardware. So that's, so you're saying like we might be living in sort of a sweet spot where you can do cool things with decent hardware. But in the future, simply scaling the model seems to be performing reliably well, at least in the language space. And uh, if we move that way, though, then I guess just basic ML research or at least cutting edge ML research might be out of reach for many, which would be unfortunate. I think. Yeah, it's, it's, it's we're going back down right now, but I do think it'll eventually go back up right now. People are training state of the art yeah. models for five hundred dollars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, uh, yeah, this has always been, like, I've tried to sort of act as a bit of a, a countermeasure to the trend. So, like, when, when I started working with YOLO, like, one of the main things I wanted to do is just make the models really accessible and make it really easy for anybody to train. So, we've got, you know, really simple models you can train in, like, under an hour in CoLab with just a few images. Um, but at the same time, you know, you see the other end of the spectrum. You see models like GPT-4. Nobody even knows how big it is because it's a mm -hmm. secret. And uh, God knows how long it takes to train that thing and how many millions of dollars. So, <laughs> so it seems like, I don't know, to, to kind of like make headlines in at least in the language space these days, you have to be like really well financed, have a lot of backing, a lot of cloud. So the vision yeah. space is a little different though. Like you can still come out with like a really cool model uh, that's trained in a few days. So that's kind of exciting. Like I like that a little more. It gives me like a nice warm fuzzy <laughs> feeling that like students can use this and they can feel like they can really like contribute to making like SOTA advancements. So. I mean, that that really is the amazing thing about what y'all have done. I mean, from the in-size models up to the X, I mean, you get you, you can really run it on just about anything. And it's pretty awesome. Yeah. 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 I yeah know actually, when I, so when I started, sorry, let's say like maybe three years ago, four years ago, I, uh, when I first created the, the app that's now the Ultralytics app, it like it barely ran. Like on, on the iPhone, it like the thing heated up, it killed the battery in like 30 minutes. The frame rate was terrible. And I was just like, ah, like this isn't going to work very well. And um, every year since then, like, you know, like Tim Cook has come out there, come out with like a new version and, and it just keeps getting faster. So there, there are like really impressive hardware advancements. Um, I don't know. Uh, so like it, in some sense, like it is keeping pace. Like, let's see, like the tops on Apple A&E, which is like my preferred mobile device. I think it's gone from like less than one to almost 20 trillion operations per second, like in the last like four years. So it's pretty impressive. But in the last couple of years, it has plateaued. I think it's gone from like 15 to 17 or something like that in the last two years. So, so yeah, you can, uh, can definitely see that, uh, I guess, the size of models and people's ambitions is making bigger, much, much easier to change than, than scaling the hardware. But, no, we'll okay, let's, uh, yeah, that's let's, why you need let's a good back, cloud. Let's get back to the topic cloud. at hand. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Because paper space is actually going to grow with the times. <laughs> to stack up a lot of IPUs there. <laughs> um, by the way, let's see, I'm, I'm wearing a Havana t-shirt. What's, what are the Havana chips called? They're not called IPUs. They're called, is there like some uh, special terminology yeah. for this? I'm not, I'm not actually familiar with them to be honest. Uh, oh, they're, yeah, I've, I've never used them. I just thought I got, I got a free t-shirt at a trade show, but they are a startup that came out of Tel Aviv. They started working on chips and Intel snatched them up. Uh, mm. So now they've got these kind of like Gaudi processors uh, that do training and inference. So they're a little, little bit like GraphCore. They're like GraphCore that's living in a big company, Intel. 
Interesting. Yeah, no, I will. Uh, I'll pass that on. Kind of, <laughs> kind of like Amazon's chips too. Amazon's also getting the the chip game with their Tranium and Infrachip chips. So yeah, Apple too. I mean, it's yeah, everybody's well, <laughs> making everything in house. Well, Apple's yeah, Apple's getting into the game. It's more more direct to the end user. Like they want your, their chip to be like in your hands, whereas yeah, like Amazon. Great. Is more like, you know, rent it from us in the cloud, which is sort of well, like Google is doing with their TPUs. I think eventually the, uh, you know, we may see the M3 processor competing with, you know, maybe like the last generation A100s or something like that. I could see that definitely happening, uh, considering they're already getting like, I think they have, they already have like 50 gig uh, VRAM chips, I think, but don't quote me on that. Yeah, that no, uh, core, core, core ML models uh yolo v8 core ML models for example they run insanely fast i have an m2 macbook and the speed is just incredible obviously you can't train in a core ML format but once your model is trained in pytorch you can export it to core ML with a single line of code and if you want to do something weird like set up a server on your mac and and run core ML models you could do that and they're just they're super fast it's almost they're about as fast as you know the fastest nvidia cards not the a100s but they're definitely comparable to a t4 and maybe faster actually hmm. Because you don't you don't have data moving back and forth from CPU to GPU you know? like on or at least in I don't know maybe like on Apple if you do it's more tight I think it's integrated. like within the M3 chip yeah 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 so yeah. there's definitely there's like real advantages there yeah but I I pushed this yeah. on a non sequitur again I'm sorry <laughs> yeah okay yeah, yeah. No, this is this is this is the cool conversations that kind of like float in my head okay all right so I think you have a like a bit of a demo right that you can show us uh, paper space oh, notebooks. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. You want to share your screen? Um, yeah, I can do that. Uh, give me two seconds. Let me make sure everything's ready. Hold okay. up the wrong window. Okay. Thanks for your patience, everybody. Uh, okay. So here I've got, um, the uh, gradient notebook ultralytics uh, slash ultralytics uh, uh, repo. Uh, and to get to this, it's very easy. Um, all you need to do is go to the ultralytics GitHub and click on this run on gradient button. And once you're in there, right. it will take you into, uh, this just shows the readme, but you can get to all the different files that are contained within the repo. Um, and if you don't already have an account, um, you can sign up for one to get access to our free GPUs. Uh, I, I recommend this if you wanted to walk through with the tutorial. It will ask you for a credit card, but we, we won't ever charge you unless you are using a paid GPU or go over your storage limits. I would be surprised if you went over your storage limit on a YOLO V8 demo. Um, it's uh, <laughs> it's a bit lighter than you know, some of the other stuff that's come out recently. Uh, another thing you may want to do is this will this will automatically put you in a C4 right now. So you can do uh, um, like this. Uh, add on. Okay, uh, so C4 mark. is is one of the light uh, instance types, right? It's the free. Yeah, one. that's one of our light instance types. I think we actually need to fix that at some point, but uh, it, right now it's it automatically puts you in that. I've got the demo running on a free A100. Uh, if you're a growth member uh, at Paperspace, oh, wow. I think $35 a month, you can get unlimited access to our free A100s. Um, which, oh, really? Well, yeah, I didn't know that. Quick, Excuse me. Okay. I mean, huh. yeah, nine hours of runtime on uh, a normal A100 would get you this. So uh, it's, a, it's a really wonderful deal, if you ask me. Um, yeah, it does sound pretty good. I used to have, I used to have a Colab subscription, but then most of the high-end GPUs sort of vanished over there, and I've, I left that go a few months ago. Collab um, has uh, Collab has some distinct disadvantages compared to us. Notably, you can't select your GPU there. Uh, even on your paid, yeah. you're going to get allocated whatever they gave you. Uh, mm -hmm. With us, you can always pick what you want. We have a super wide variety of different GPUs. And as I said earlier, IPUs and CPUs. Um, so everything from uh, uh, Maxwell series up to Ampere. And we're getting Hopper GPUs next month. Um, oh, really? <laughs> are, oh, yeah. If you are interested in H100s to anybody listening, definitely reach out to our sales team. Um, it'll be a little bit longer before they're available just to everyone on the platform. Um, That's exciting. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, no, I'm pumped. Definitely uh, train Yellow V9 with us. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so we've got uh, we got the demo here. Uh, I'm going to just walk us through the uh, tutorial notebook that uh, Glenn and his team have so graciously provided. Um, to get this to run, all you got to do really is just hit run all and it'll run everything. Um, but we can go through it iter iteratively. Um, we actually already have uh, uh, we already have a version of Ultralytics installed, but I think it updates. Um, and then yeah, I just saw that. So it looks like let's see, right after the install, it pulls up the stats on your system. So yeah, so you got an A one hundred here, SXM four, nice. Then uh, we got this first uh, prediction section. Um, I'd be I'd be shocked if any of you weren't as familiar with YOLO, but uh, just really quickly. Uh, the object detection model will uh, look for whatever we are uh, trying to find in the image. In this case, uh, it's looking for, I, I think, cocoa objects. Um, so it'll find uh, people and uh, looks like a tie. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. And the, so uh, we've actually got, let's see, so detection is where YOLO started. It's like from the very early days, uh, when Joseph Rebin first was working on the models, they're all detection based. They still are it's sort of bread and butter, the sweet spot of YOLO. It's what you see here in the picture. But more recently, we've also expanded to different tasks, as they're called. So now we also offer segmentation models, uh, pose models, classification models, and built-in tracking, too, using uh, a parameterized tracker. But right now, it's using SOTA trackers, which are byte track and, I think, byte sort, or bot sort, uh, yeah. Yeah, I haven't so got, to, I for example, had as much opportunity to play with the other, uh, the other tools. Um, but yeah, I, yeah, they are I not too many people here. know about them. Yeah, they're all, they all come with the Ultralytics PIP package. And uh, the, the way the models work is, for example, you have YOLO V8 S or N.PT. If you just put a dash deg for SEG or dash pose, then you'll get segmentation models or pose models. Yeah, right there. Yeah, so this will actually run a, a segmentation inference. It'll yeah. download the model since it doesn't exist locally and run it again. Let's see, that'll put it into predict three. Or predict yeah, forward. so this is going to drop it into a new predict directory. So every time you run a job, like a prediction or a validation, then you get a new directory created in your runs directory. Yeah, right there. So this will be in segment. Yeah. See, so it's in run, segment, and then predict. Yep. And then that, that'll be the result right there. Yeah. Oh, there it is. <laughs> so this is the same image, just with the segmentation model. And this and is the nano model. The... So it's... This okay. is a, yeah, this is the nano model that's like 3 million parameters, just 3 million. That's exactly <laughs> what I was about to say. I mean, that's uh, yeah. <laughs> pretty powerful stuff there. I mean, there's only some minor smudging uh, and always hands, hands are always a nightmare with anything vision. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Really smooth. Especially the gender. <laughs> yeah. The six finger oh, hands. Yeah, if uh, yeah, if any of you have used stable diffusion, there's entire research projects dedicated to fixing hands. <laughs> <laughs> That's encouraging. So, uh, it's, it's good to know they're working on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, gotta gotta love the open source community. Um, so uh, it, after this, we get into this val section um, where we can validate the model's accuracy uh, on Coco and. Uh, this will quickly download uh, the validation subset using Torch. And then- um, yeah, yeah, that's right. I actually don't, I actually don't, I'm, I'm just, are these uh, already pre-trained on Coco? And is that why they just get such good results out of the box or? Uh... Uh, yeah, yeah. So all these models that you're downloading are pre-trained on Coco. So Coco comes in different flavors. It's got detection labels, but it's also got segmentation labels and then also pose labels. And so we train the, the YOLO V8 models individually on the different types of labels in the data set. So uh, let's, let's see, so we're looking at here is just the detection model. And yeah, since it's pre-trained on Coco, that's why it's getting good results here. It's yeah. validating on a smaller version of Coco. It's called Coco 128. And this just has the first 128 images in the Coco data set. But when you just click this cell, it'll start running validation. Uh, so it's gonna take the model, it's gonna get predictions, and it's going to compare those against the labels. And it's going to use those to compute metrics on the differences between the predictions and the labels. And that's what we see here. Uh, we see it per category. So it's broken down, well, not just per category, but also for different metrics, like precision, recall, 
than Matt 50 and Matt 50 to 95. It looks like that didn't output there. Yeah. Yeah, it's supposed to say Matt 50 to 95. Not sure why oh. I didn't do that. Oh, well. Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah it's uh, very effective just out of the box. So uh, you can really use YOLO already just for <laughs> any of these real objects. If you uh, <laughs> yeah. already have, all uh, you've done is like click a few buttons and you're already validating, predicting, downloading models. And then we got speeds too. So at the end, you can see the, the accuracies and then the speeds yes. at the bottom there. Yeah. Definitely useful information. This yep. is good if you, uh, if you want, if you are on paper space and you wanted to try out some of our different GPUs, I'm running this on an A180 G, uh, 80 gigabyte, which is uh, probably the fastest other than the hoppers, uh, single GPU from NVIDIA available right now. So this is uh, lightning. Um, if we were doing this on an, uh, the free GPU, which is the Maxwell M4000, only has eight gigabytes of RAM, probably, I would guess, take you know about 40 seconds, um, but it's just an estimate. So uh, definitely recommend um, paying attention to those values and you know you may get some savings by using some different machines. Um, I actually have a benchmark on that I'll share later, which we made using, I think YOLO V5. Mm -hmm, cool. Um, so uh, next section, talking about training. Uh, I can just quickly go through this. If, if you're not familiar with the, uh, the, the normal recommended uh, Ultralytics you know, loop, uh, definitely recommend you label and source your data on RoboFlow. They make it so easy. Um, uh, I, I'll present an opportunity later, but we'll talk about why it's definitely not a perfect one, uh, a, a perfect alternative. I mean, I think I said something else. Um, but yeah, RoboFlow is kind of the de facto place to go. You can label your images. They'll give you on their free accounts uh, different augmentations that will artificially expand your data set quite a bit. Really, really powerful tool. Uh, then for yeah, the training, true. you can come in here, do your training. Um, I mean, really, you could just replace the data uh, in a Cocoa.yaml or, you know, re replace this value with a corresponding YAML that you filled out. And it, that's all you need to do to train a model. Um, mm -hmm. and yeah, then that's pretty can, much it. Yep. And we got built-in logging, ClearML, Comet. Um, there's also TensorBoard within Paperspace if you prefer that. Um, mm -hmm. and finally you can export it out. Uh, I will say you can also deploy with paper space. Um, oh, cool. Maybe we should put our, uh, Oh, we should, yeah, we should show that a little later then. We should yeah, put, yeah. put you guys over there on the right too. <laughs> I'm trying to think if I have a deployment ready on hand, um, I haven't put, I haven't containerized the, uh, application yet. Um, but there may be a way I can throw that together really quickly. We'll see. Uh, if yeah. not, maybe I'll find something we can share uh, with others later on Twitter or something like that. Okay. Does um, the deployment work um, like the way you get to pick a GPU and uh, in an instance here? Like, can you do the same thing on the deployment set? Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's completely the same. And then, um, you know, if you have uh, an application that you want to serve, it will. Uh, you can just basically do everything that the application does within that containerized environment. And it's got multi-GPU, single GPU, CPU, uh, full full gamut of options. So if you're just running well, inference, well, okay. I mean, uh, if you're just running inference on a YOLO V8N, you might just want a C7, you know? Uh, that could mm -hmm. run very easily um, in a reasonable amount of time. So uh, definitely recommend checking out the deployments um, from a, Pricing and variety perspective, it's really nice uh, tool compared to some of the other options out there. Uh, yeah. Really okay. quick, uh, let's just run this training. It should take about, I don't know, 30 seconds, if I remember correctly. Oh, yeah, the training's really fast. <laughs> it's, uh, oh, I don't know. Uh, oh, yeah, actually, we got a. I didn't so log like into got way too much to install it. So if we, yeah, so we can do one DB disabled, or you can kind of like put your login key there. If you put your login key, then it'll automatically log everything you do to WandDB. This one also works. It'll. Uh, oh, I didn't know you could do that. Oh, will that create a? That'll create like a public page, like an anonymous page. Yeah, exactly. So you can oh, look cool, at it cool. later. Okay. okay. Oh, if you don't need to save your work. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's over here. Yeah. 
Oh, cool, cool. Okay. I think I might. Okay, I thought I was going to try to log me in for a moment there. Uh, oh yeah, see, so you got a public page and you're not logged in. It just made up a project name for you, and now it's logging everything there. Clear yeah, disco. Okay. Clear disco one run. Cool. Okay. Uh, it looks like it's not loading yet. Uh, doesn't matter. It's probably because it's, yeah, it's, so it's running a validation at the yeah. very end there, and then it syncs everything up to one DB. Let's see. Let's refresh that. Yes, yeah, so I think if you refresh now, you should probably see a few lines here. It can be really short because it's only three epochs. But uh, oh, I was looking at the wrong place. Oh, uh, there we go. Yeah. So these are learning rates. There's different parameter groups. That's what PG stands for here. Normally these uh these look a little smoother, but since there's only three epochs, yeah. The last two <laughs> are going up because there's a warm-up period before they start going down. Can you um can you alter the warm-up steps uh in the the pack? Yeah, like yeah. Run? Oh cool. Yeah, so and let's see in Yolo V8, every hyperparameter and every setting is just in your configuration file. Uh um, and you can override any of those. So like the warm up period and epochs, uh, and also like a few warm up effects are also in there, and and you can override those in the command line, like right here, uh, or you can like just change your YAML file, and then it'll inherit those. Um, where's our YAML file in here? Oh, so okay, so let's see. The YAML file is that's a good question. Um, all right, so we've got some, we've got some commands. I think. Well, uh, the thing is, it. it, it it knows that YAML file, I think you all already have it. So it probably just isn't in here. Yeah, yeah. The best best way to find this stuff is you go to the docs. So we've got really good docs now. If you go to docs.ultralytics.com, and then we've got a config section and it explains the YAML file and the arguments and all that. Yeah. Okay. Definitely recommend uh checking that out. I have uh I have one we can look at in a sec. Actually, whatever. I'm just pull it up. Mm -hmm. Uh this is one I just made for my demo, um, it's missing, you know, 80% of the fields. <laughs> it's it could super have. simple. Yeah. Um, yeah. This is just the automatically populated YAML, but you know, you, you could put in the names of your categories, uh, the number of categories, the paths. Um, like you said, there's a lot more configuration information. Um, definitely yeah. recommend the test. This. The test one's optional. So if you don't have test data, you can just omit that part. Yeah. You just leave it blank. Ooh, good to know. Uh, all right, so we've got these here. Ooh. And you can Ooh, also access them. Um, sorry? I know we get to the, the, the fun part, which is the export section. Oh, uh, yeah. You can export <laughs> in all these different formats. Um, I think we were talking earlier about using Core ML. Um, that's one example. Um, Paddle Paddle is pretty popular. I've never used this outside is, of Torch. I don't see the reason to, but uh, I can understand why some might. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, I, well, there's some interesting things coming out of Paddle, but it's mostly coming from Paddle, not into Paddle. Like uh, yeah. like the recent RT data model came from the Baidu team. So we're analyzing that right now. It's really interesting, but uh, there's definitely some good R&D coming out of it. So, oh yeah, no, they, they seem to always be at the forefront, if not making whatever is hot right now, yeah. iterating on it. Yeah, 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 they're doing a really impressive job. But you're right, I don't know who would really want to export from Ultralytics to Paddle, but if you want to, it's there. <laughs> we got you yeah, covered. no, I love it. <laughs> it. A wealth of options is the best thing you can give your users. Um, yeah, and yeah. I mean, as you this, put here- This section is where I spend most of my time because we have to interact with so many other packages here. This is kind of like the most complicated part of, of what we do. I can imagine. Uh, and you know, as your pro tips say, it, it's worth it to export sometimes. Uh, yeah. So yeah. So for for the people that aren't like super experts at this, uh, PyTorch format is really good for training, and obviously it lets you do things like back propagation that you need for training. But once you're done training, then it comes with a lot of features that you don't really need. And if you can strip those away, then you'll end up with a faster inference time. And that's what these other formats do. So for example, Onyx. Uh, it doesn't allow you to train. It's not as feature filled, but that's actually a benefit because you strip away all those things you don't need to do. And then you're just much better at one thing, which is just running inference quickly. 
And so if you have a CPU, you're going to get the best results typically with Onyx or OpenVINO. If you have an Intel CPU, probably OpenVINO. Uh, but if you're running on a GPU, CUDA device, uh, like a NVIDIA 3090, then Tensor RT is definitely, definitely going to be the fastest way to go. You can get up to a 5x speed up compared to mm. PyTorch GPU. So. Definitely keep that in mind for deployment. Yeah, yeah, it's super important. I didn't realize that for like the first two years I was in AI. So. <laughs> well, Just I learning mean, things as I go here. Everything is, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, they've got an example here. Um, you can just change the format easily like this. Mm -hmm. um, so change it to Onyx. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have play. Onyx installed, it'll just install it for you too. Oh, there you yeah, go. Yeah, that's why I changed it. Um, <laughs> yep. It's a nice little example. Like the uh, Ultralytics uh, package is very versatile. <laughs> um, so finally, we've got here just a, a more full put it together example of using uh, Ultralytics uh, Yellow V8 in Python. Um, and it's got a new example image here. It's a bus. Um, mm -hmm. It'll load in. The model with that format, you can just, you know, if you wanted to do a Yolo V8X or something like that, since we've got such a big GPU, let's do it. Um, it'll then train it on Kogan 128, validate it, get your results, and export it. Um, and I'm just going to run this while we walk through the next section, but just to show how fast it is. Yeah. Um, yeah okay. Oh, and these are the tasks I was telling you about. Yes. We got to add a post to this. We're working on updating this graphic, actually. Uh, I definitely want to do a write-up. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, this is uh, these are the additional tasks it can do. Um, makes sense that it can do classification. I mean, object detection is just, you know, <laughs> yeah, a classification of a specific portion of an image, really. Or uh, what is it? Object identification and classification is object detection. Um, segmentation. Yeah. Uh, is the other big one we showed that earlier with the Zidane demo. Uh, you also mentioned there is uh, pose following and tra uh, pose tracking, I mean. Um, is, it, is that pose estimation different than pose tracking or? Oh, so yeah, the terminology works like this. So what we do is we detect key points as they're called, which is just points in an image. Uh, so if you're detecting key points on people, it'll probably be things like their shoulders, their elbows. And if you put those together into sort of a stick figure, then that's called pose. So the Kogo data set calls it a uh, Kogo 2017 po or key points data set. Uh, but then we train and we create a pose model. But then tracking is actually separate. Tracking is not built into any of our models, uh, but it's a step that you can intersperse between prediction steps. So you predict and then track and predict and track. And this allows you to, to follow the same object uh, through a video. And this is really useful. This is actually like necessary if you want to do say counting. So if you want to count like the number of people coming out of the subway, uh, then you can't just predict the people. You can't just put the boxes because in the next uh, frame of the video, like you don't know uh, how many new people there are and how many existing people there are. And so if you want to know, say like the traffic going through the subway at a certain time period, then you can track the people uh, when they cross the threshold, like a line, an arbitrary line of the image, then you count the person. So Tracking can be applied to detection models, segmentation models, and pose models. So you can mm -hmm. combine either of those together. And you don't need to change anything about the training. It's completely independent, and you just do it later. Oh, fascinating. Yeah. yeah. I appreciate that info. Um, yeah, it's something <laughs> I haven't really dived into. But it sounds like it's really easy to integrate YOLO V8 with whatever you need to. I know that's been my experience. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, pose, pose is really cool. It's... Uh, and we just we just got into this actually just a few weeks ago we launched these models so and of course they come in the same size too so we have like a nano pose model that actually does a decent job it's really cool i mean we're here yeah 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 exactly you can run this here so just do uh, yeah oh oh let's see what did it say i think um i i actually noticed an error i think something happened with the onyx install that yeah sometimes uh, when you install packages it's good to restart your system yeah. So it could be associated with that. Uh, yeah, let's try to restart and see what happens. Oh, restart the whole machine? Oh, no, no, just what you did, I think. Restart kernel. Okay. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah, so it, take, it takes a moment to spin back up if that's the case. Yeah. All right. Um, All right. Same thing, huh? 
So it looks like uh, it changed something from this underscore PB2. Hmm. Don't, oh. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes there's protocol. dependency conflicts. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, so uh, if you all are doing this demo, don't export an Onyx model uh, yet. <laughs> that is, uh, we need to fix that bug. Um, <laughs> but that's on our end, not theirs. So go figure. I guess every, every uh, environment's different. So you never know what's going to happen. Yeah, ain't that the truth? Yeah. Ain't that the truth? Yeah. So uh, we'll just use the already done examples uh, for these next ones. But uh, so here we're just quickly training a detection model, um, and it outputs the full results of a. Uh, yeah, these inference. are the Python outputs from the results. Yeah. yeah. So you actually get uh, you get a lot of information. You get the boxes, the image, the size, the speeds, and all that in the classes. Yeah, so. and it's um, it's a results object. Uh, but I think it's a, yeah. you could say it's in dictionary JSON format. So it's pretty easy to parse. Yeah, um, it's an object because uh, it allows us to do cool things. Like it's got methods. Like you can, for example, uh, like turn the boxes from XY with height to like XY, XY, things like that. Mm. Uh, or you can just access the values here, like you're seeing. Yeah. And the uh, dot plot obviously is uh, very useful. The dot plot, for example, yeah, that's yeah, super yeah. cool. Very yeah, very quickly uh, seeing what you're working yeah. with here. Um, mm -hmm. This isn't saved, otherwise I would pull it up. Um, then next we got segmentation. We we saw that example of segmentation uh, earlier, so you can just uh, this is just training on Cocoa 128, uh, and then you know working on Cocoa 128, kind of a proof of concept. But uh, if we had this, we'd be able to see the bus separated out. Um, actually, all these yeah, images yeah. are on uh, on y'all's uh, um, repo, I think, or if not the repo, yeah, then... these are these are in the assets. There's only two images in the assets, just Zane and Bust.jpg. Yeah, well, I meant the uh, segmented ones. I, I I'm sure I've seen them somewhere else before. Oh no, you're right. Yeah, yeah. So if you oh. if you expand the section, if you expand like segmentation, no, then where are these? Um, I know I've seen them somewhere. That's a good, well, well, yeah, we don't have them. We should put them in here because I know what you're talking about. I've seen these before. Yeah. Uh, Everything's well, a work in progress. So it looks like we got to update the docs a little bit with some of these examples. But you're right. We've got, we've got a graphic here that shows the concept, but not the actual results. So I think we well, need to show the actual results. I think that'll help a well, lot. We would be very easy, it would be very easy to see the actual results if, if we didn't have that little problem. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. Um, I can honestly just... Spin this machine. I think if you just up. restart the system, then they should yeah. definitely work. Yeah. By the way, so I noticed we've been talking a while, so time just kind of flew by here. Um, let's see here. So we should probably, uh, like, I think one of the coolest things you mentioned maybe is on the deployment. Oh, and here we're looking at machines too. Oh yeah, this okay, is. Okay, so uh, these are these are all the different machines that you can select, huh? Yeah, full uh, full gamut. Um, so now, what is free mean exactly? Are not available. Like, where's right the? Uh, what? Okay. So we, yeah, we have, we're subject to, uh, you know, the f physical limitation, uh, you know, we only have so many machines. So, uh, if a lot of people are using a certain type, they won't be, uh, they'll be out of capacity on here. So the free GPU mm -hmm. is the one that I I'd, I'd recommended to everybody to check out. That's an M4000, uh, no cost. If you pay $8 a month, you get access to the next tier of free GPUs, which are these, uh, P P5000 to A4000. And then the growth tier gets you up to that, uh, 30, uh, sorry, 80 gigabyte A100. Um, okay, so for 35 a month, you get access to all the ones you're showing there without any limits? You don't get shut uh, down after a few hours? Or? They have, if they have this free in front of it, yeah. Mm -hmm. So like right now I could spin up a free A6000 where uh, the free A1, A, A100 80 gigabyte was uh, out of capacity. Oh, I think if you, if you show up early, you can get one before everybody else takes one. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. <laughs> um, pretty much. Uh, and these, uh, yeah, these free free GPUs. If you are on a paid account, you will never have to pay to use them. So you know, if you're using, let's say, uh, a reasonable three hours of GPU time a day over a month um, on an A6000. I can't remember the exact cost right now. Let's just click. Oh, 189. So you know, that's uh, 90 times. 189, uh, significantly cheaper to do it on the uh, growth plan. So, so just you okay. know, just a heads up. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, it's like thirty dollars versus uh ninety eight or something like that. I think it would be or one point eight nine. No, it would be double that. Uh, okay. hundred eighty something. Yeah, so quick math. Nvidia is really coming out with uh, a lot of different devices these days. I think I'm I'm gonna need uh like a chart on my wall just to make sense of it all. I, these uh, micro like I know the highest end devices cool. and the lowest ones, but everything in between. Like for example, like an M four thousand versus an A four thousand. What does M? What does the M designator mean, really? M is the uh, so those are the microarchitectures. These are denoted by these uh, A's and V's and P's. Um, so mm -hmm. one of the earliest. So P doesn't stand for Pascal. Uh, yes, exactly. One of the earliest. Oh, Maxwell, so this is an older one. Okay. Maxwell, then Pascal, then. Um, oh, so the M is before Pascal. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Maxwell and Pascal, uh, and I think no, uh, they had the first Voltas, which um, the naming is a little strange on here. Those, you know, you could also put in the RTXs. Yeah, we're starting to kind of merge the consumer names with the enterprise names. The yeah. RTX 5000, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to differentiate. This is like them. the prosumer card? Uh, yeah, the quadro cards. Yeah. Oh, the quadro cards, yeah. Um, and, and you like an org chart for the NVIDIA GPU. That's, that's what I need, I think. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. If you want to learn about these, I think we um, trying to remember. Do you guys where. have a guide? Yes. Huh. com slash. Uh, Nvidia you know, uh, I'm just going to Google it because I can't remember the URL, but I know it's a uh, um, something like this. Uh, GPU cloud. Hmm. That's what it was. Okay. Ooh. Wow. Okay. I just uh, popped over onto YouTube here. So I see we've got a few questions. All right. Uh, but uh, let's see, before we get to the questions, James, could you maybe show us real quick in a few minutes uh, how the deployment works? Yeah. Um, so I, I'm just going to, I'm just going to pull up a sample one that I already have. Uh, see. Okay. I think, oh, no, it would be in here. Excuse me. Oh, is it? Sorry, my project organization leaves a little to be desired. Okay, so deployments. Um, in the deployments page, uh, basically you can, uh, if you already have a containerized um, environment to serve your um, deep learning model somewhere on, you know, like Docker Hub or uh, NGC or something like that, then you can uh, plug it in directly here to be used on any of our different machines, uh, except for the IPUs. IPUs are coming. Um, so you can just use the machine selection to pick whatever out you want. Uh, then you put in the image. Uh, you can have it pushed to whatever port you want to. Um, and then you can also override the default command. So you know if you uh, have an application you're running, let's say you're doing it with Gradio, uh, one of the big things with Gradio is you need to tell it to use this 0.0.0.0 uh, server host name. Otherwise, it'll default to one, I think it's 127.0.0.1. Um, just a, a thing. You can also add environment variables if you needed to, uh, you know, uh, directly export some sort of uh, named variable. Uh, and we also have integration with our model storage. So if you've uh, trained a model and put it onto uh, our platform, you can access it using this op slash model ID uh, location. Um, so I've got a quick example. Um, this is made with uh, Surge. Um, let's see. Surge is just Surge. a uh, cool little platform for serving different Llama models. Um, and it's got mm. probably the widest variety I've found, um, and it's a super easy way to get them on there. And using a deployment with us is super easy. Um, since this is it's already been done, it's not showing up here, but you just have to set it to enabled if it's disabled or you know hit create on that last page. You're there. Mm -hmm. And once that's done, it'll submit. Um, I've got this running on an A6000 times two instance. Mm -hmm. uh, cool. There's options to put in health checks um, as well as um, scaling. Uh, I didn't put any of that in there just because this was a simple demo. I I I, I didn't know we were going to be jumping into this. Um, but if you if you <laughs> yeah, I didn't either. Have, actually. Yeah, if you wanted to have health so, checks uh, or um uh the option to scale up to more machines, then it's very easy to add, uh, and you can see information about that in our docs at docs.paperspace.com. 
Mm -hmm. um, okay. Once your deployment is ready, you can you know also see in the logs what's going on over here. Okay, so you get this endpoint. And does the endpoint stay alive until you shut it down? Or, uh... Exactly. So it's running, okay. uh, this one's running using Uvicorn at that endpoint, and then uh, our application will uh, direct that to the endpoint here. Hmm. So here we've got this uh, little GUI. Download all of our different models. I'm trying to see if there's one that's really small. Uh, this will be the fastest. How, how, so I'm not a language expert. How do these 7 billion parameters models work? Like, do they actually reply? Um, sorry, I cut you off. Yeah, so then <laughs> do, do they create kind of like useful feedback or is it really elementary? Uh, I'd say a lot of the 7B ones are still pretty basic in this current, mm -hmm. uh, current standpoint. But uh, I, I think the um, instruction tune ones do a little bit better. So Alpaca, the one we're looking at right now, uh, is, I think they made 50,000 uh, instruction uh, response, uh, you know, question answer data set uh, using GPT-4, and then fine-tuned the Llama 7B on this. Uh, for those of y'all that don't know, Llama is an open source or semi-open source, I guess, research only open source model released by Meta. Um, right. It's based on the GPT architecture. Uh, the 7B, 7 billion parameter is the smallest one, and it was not in any way fine tuned to uh, to work with human interaction. It, it, it gave some really ugly outputs. So a lot of people have been working on fine tuning LoRa uh, uh, models or delta weights that you can append on top um, that will basically make Llama work better. So uh, this Alpaca one. Uh, was one of the first ones to really get any hype. Hmm. Uh, it's a little slow right now. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> reminds me of when I went to Peru. <laughs> <laughs> I always wanted to go there. Okay. Oh, you know what? Should I just, what's going on here? Well, it seems to be uh, not wanting to start a new chat, but uh, that's uh that's a, that's okay. on surge, not on us. But uh, y'all get an idea of what's going on. Ah, yeah, the model yeah. came from. Looks like it didn't successfully download the model. I'm not sure what's going on there because it's worked in the past. But uh, yeah, that's yeah, I think uh, we that's, get the idea. That's, it's a pretty yeah, useful a demo story. here for the deployment side. Yeah. Um, if if anybody wants to uh, um, wants to get an idea of a good demo. For deployments, I've got a uh, stable diffusion web UI deployment, which I rather like. Ooh, you know, you could do, you could just paste that in the chat, I think, and then people will yeah, get Yeah, yeah. I threw that in the YouTube okay. chat. Um, and that's got a full cool. breakdown on how I made it, how I, uh, how the deployment works, um, everything you need to know really about uh, using deployments. But if you want, you can also just copy and paste uh, to get right into it. Uh, I will say that this this version of the deployment, it's not. I've updated it since six months ago, but it is not fully up to date. So I don't know if ControlNet is fully integrated. You'd have to you'd have to go in and do that for those of you that care. Um, okay. So yeah. Cool. cool. Well, hey, thanks for the demo, James, and uh, also like the notebook rundown. And let's take a look at the questions over here. Let's see what you've got. Sure. Um, okay, let me let me start from the top. Let's see. I hope some of these questions are for James. Let's see. Uh, first one looks like it's for me. How to train instant segmentation models with Ultralytic Hub? Ooh, okay, this is a good question. Uh, wow. Okay, let me explain what's up here. Uh, so the Hub team is working on integrating other tasks. Right now, we only have detection, but the very first step that we've taken is we started creating the infrastructure on the back end uh, to differentiate different data sets. So now, when you go into Hub you'll see that a data set will be labeled as an object detection data set. Uh, and we're creating the functions and uh, the visualization tools to start doing the other tasks, which are gonna be segmentation, pose, and classification. Uh, that should be coming pretty soon here. Um, I can't give a date though. Every time I give a date, uh, people always stick me to it. So I'd say pretty soon and I'll let them know that uh, we got this comment and uh, there's interest in that. 
So let's see, second question. Hello, I have a question. Have you seen Mojo? You think Yolo can work with this? No, I haven't seen Mojo. James, do you know what that is? Uh, no, I haven't. Okay, <laughs> well, that's zero for two. All right, sorry, buddy. Uh, okay, let's see here. Bye. And then Abariu AI. Let's see, it says Yolo is the best thing I've learned to use in the last time. Well, thank you. Uh, and then RD Mania says, what is Yolo V5-6? Okay, so you could be referring to two different things. Yolo V5 comes in different releases. So there's uh, release one, two, three, four, five, and so on. And the most recent one is called release, uh, I think, 7.1. So there is a release six, so you could be referring to that. But there's also a type of model called a P6 model. Uh, P6 is a larger model that operates on larger images. It's trained at 1280 image size versus the default model, which are P5 models, as they're called. Uh, the five just means that the original image size has been divided in half five times. Uh, so you're at uh, stride 32 at that point, which means that every every original group of 32 pixels at the input is turned into one pixel. Hmm. The P6 models go down to stride 64. So that's probably what v 5 6 means here. And there's pre-trained models available for that. If you have large images um, with large objects in them, then the P6 models will perform better. If you have large images with small objects, then the P5 models are probably the best you're gonna do. Uh, but if you wanna get fancy, there's also P2 versions, which uh, have outputs at stride four to detect very small objects. Hmm. Ooh, okay. And then Toka here is talking about the paper. It says, we publish the VA paper soon. Uh, so we get asked this question a lot. Like, unfortunately, the Ultralytics team is really small. Uh, we're about 10 people and we're just all working overtime just to get uh, the product launched in terms of hub and also to fill out the features for Yolo V8 uh, and to smooth out the bugs and answer the GitHub issues. Uh, we do want to publish a paper, uh, but again, I can't give a timeline for that, but hopefully we'll get to that later on this year. Ooh, okay, now we have a paper space question by H4 Hammer. He says, any time limits on paper space instances, specifically wondering about timeout limits? Yeah, what do you so think, I, saw, I saw Nick commented on that. Um, appreciate you stepping in there, man. Uh, there is um, There are time limits for the free machines. Uh, six hours is the uh, maximum. Uh, you can reset the machine instantly after that six hours is reached. Um, so it's not like a, it's not like Kaggle where there's the total time limit. It's a contiguous six hours is the limit. Uh, so I, I I assume that's what you meant by timeout. And then uh, if you were on a paid machine, you can alter the settings to have it be run as long as you want. I accidentally left a uh, core machine, which is one of our other products on for two weeks once, which was a grave error. Because um, mm. that added up expense wise. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, if you don't set it to shut down automatically, it will not. Um, you shouldn't have to worry about timeouts with us. If you're not moving your mouse, uh, it won't, I don't think it won't, I don't think it will do anything either. Cause you know, so many people will just let their models train for hours and hours. So uh, I think unless you are um, exclusively using the free GPU instances, you have nothing to worry about with timeouts. Okay. Oh, and let's see, this guy says that he's not seeing your comments, James. And actually I'm not seeing them either. Really? Not sure. Yeah. Uh, Just in the, in the, oh, make sure you're not putting them in the Zoom call. Make sure you're putting them in the YouTube chat. I am. I am. Um, let me oh, see. you are. Okay. I, That's strange. I, just subs I subscribed just now. Maybe that made a difference. Let me, okay. Let me take this next question while you do that. So, uh, KCON says TF light versus Torch script for smartphone deployment. So, okay. This is a good question. Uh, this really depends. Uh, we're obviously talking about Android here because on the on the on the Apple side, I think CoreML is obviously the way to go. Um, Apple does a lot of sort of management for you that Android doesn't do. So on the iOS side, it's really convenient to have CoreML uh, with a lot of the features that it provides. Um, so the the ANE, which is the Apple Neural Engine, will automatically distribute layers to the fastest possible backend. And it comes with a lot of pipelining features too, like NMS pipelining. So you can create a single core ML model that does the prediction in the NMS and then just gives you detections. Android is much more complicated. 
Um, obviously, because of the array of OEMs, uh, even within OEMs, there's different ASIC providers. And so this is uh, an interesting landscape to say the least. We've got one mobile developer and he's got his hands full kind of covering both bases, Apple and Android, uh, which is pretty impressive. I'm not sure how he does it, but okay. If we go to Android, uh, the Ultralytics app is running TF Lite. It's been the default that we've used for a while. We've explored different options, not just SourceScript, but also OpenVINO uh, and a few other exotic ideas. Uh, but the Ultralytics app right now, it runs TF Lite models that are exported at FP16. And we have to create our own NMS. Uh, so there's code that's built in uh, that we've written that handles NMS uh, and then outputs detections that way. So this, this works well for detection models, uh, but we're looking to bring other tasks to the phone also. So we've got pose models, for example, segmentation models that we also need to get to the app. Uh, and this is more complicated. Now, now we're in a place that Apple doesn't offer fully pipelined solutions. And we may have to introduce sort of custom NMS also on the Apple side. Uh, and on the Android side, which you really have. But in terms of performance, uh, okay, so let's see, Android offers and TF Lite offers support for different uh, delegates, as they're called. There's Hexagon delegates, there's NNAPI delegates, there's GPU delegates, and there's TPU delegates. And uh, depending on which one you try and target, you may have certain success on, on different hardware providers, uh, or you may not. So it's a bit tricky, but um, from our experiments, uh, TF Lite seems to be the most common way to go. So when you're looking at these things, you don't always want like the leading cutting edge, most exotic solution because it's probably gonna not be very well adopted and supported. So if you go to that repo and you ask some questions, it might be tougher to get support. Uh, so in that sense, I think TF Lite is the safest way to go. Uh, if you're looking for like absolutely the best performance, uh, then I would definitely try and target the specific backend and the delegate, like a hexagon delegate. I think if you're using Qualcomm chips. So. Okay, uh, let's see. And then Chandu here, Chandu Surasetti. He says, have we heard about Yolo Nest? And yes, we have. So uh, we actually did a trip to Tel Aviv a few months ago and uh, we, we met with the, the Desi team and all that. We gave them a bit of a show and tell of what we were up to and they did also. The so Yolo Nest is really interesting. It's, um, I think it's interesting from the perspective of uh, like it's an automated architecture search, which uh, is a bit different from what we do. Like we do a, like a Glenn architecture search. So I usually come up with ideas, throw them into the system, track the results and just kind of iterate from there. Uh, I think the best solution is probably a bit of both worlds though. I think you want like a bit of uh, like human intuition to come in, push you in the right direction. Uh, but then it's also nice to have automated solutions that can really take over and just uh, carry off on their own. Uh, so for example, YOLO v5 has a hyperparameter search, which is automated. So you can just turn it on let it run for weeks or months, and it'll return back hyperparameters that are really optimized for your specific task. And Desi's doing a good job of doing that, but on the architecture search side. Uh, so the latest models are pretty impressive. Uh, and I think it's exciting, like every time something new comes out, uh, we export it to Onyx, we start looking at the architecture and we start trying to learn and figure out like what we can kind of cherry pick from these advancements to keep YOLO growing. So I think in the future, uh, we'll be able to improve YOLO V8 and uh, of course, not just from YOLO NAS, but from all the contributions going on out there. I think RT Debtor is like one of the other exciting contributions right now coming out of the Bybee team at Paddle Paddle. Mm -hmm. There's a lot. There's oh, a lot. Wow. Okay, so that, yeah, yeah. Um, it's, uh, I do want to mention, track. I do want to mention that Desi is a client of ours. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, let's see here. Uh, Oof, okay, we've got a few more questions. Uh, okay, let me get a few more and then I think we'll call it time because we're coming up on the hour. Uh, let's see, links might get filtered. Okay, did you get through? Not seeing, oh, it's just a conversation. Mm. Could you share on the Ultralytics Discord? Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay, uh, James, yeah. Okay, oh, by the way, the Discord is something kind of new and exciting we did. Uh, so before we experimented with different ways to kind of get to the community, we started off with a discourse forum. We had a Slack channel. <laughs> And it looks like Discord is really much better. Everybody likes it a lot more. And there's like more people signing up to it. It's kind of, a, kind of like a more interactive feel. So like you can answer a question. It feels like you're chatting more than uh, you get on like a discourse community, which is more of like a GitHub issues where you send your question. You don't really expect to get it answered maybe until tomorrow. 
Uh, so if nobody's signed up yet, you can go just to the Ultralytics repo. There's a, a Discourse icon. Just click that. And you'll get right in there. Can I um, can I share these links? Uh, what's a good yeah, yeah. channel to share this in the Discord? <laughs> so I'm still I'm still not seeing your messages, but uh, let's see if you're in Discord. Uh, I don't know. That's a good question. Maybe let me take a look. Let me pop in here. I can just put it in welcome. Yeah, that's a good place. I think no, that everyone's no likely to show down this. None of these channels uh, have permissions. Uh, okay. Okay. Then oh, yeah, let's see yeah, if yeah. you pass it to me. I can go ahead and add in here after this is done. Okay. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, yeah. Glenn will share all the links I shared. So good to them. Okay. Oof. Okay, guys. All right. I think that's it then. <laughs> Just been really right awesome. Hour, involved a lot, James. Yeah, yeah, right on time. So thanks a lot, James. Thanks for the intro. And if anybody has any more questions, you know, feel free to uh, leave those on our repo and a GitHub issue. Let us know on Discord. Uh, and James and I'll get back to you. So yeah. thank you thank guys. Thank you all so much. Thank you, James. And thank you, Glenn. <laughs> Talked yep. over you again. Okay, ciao. Appreciate you very much. Hope you have a wonderful rest of your day, y'all. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Have a great week.